you're watching an episode of Shiftcast. You can catch the full episode on our YouTube channel or on Spotify. Let's get right into it. Eastbound, our guest for today. We're going to have plenty of time to talk to him about some coaching and stuff, but uh, how are you feeling this afternoon? I'm, I'm feeling great. I mean, they told me to stay up until midnight local time. I'll gladly for shift the first edition. It's, it's a pleasure being here, to be fair. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much for staying up this late. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now I have at least someone with me who feels my struggle. Because these so, yeah, guys said, over there at 6 p.m. Afternoon. I said afternoon. You I guys gotta, I gotta eat there. a late dinner when we do this. I don't know. That yeah. sounds a lot worse than it that. It is already the next day for us. Yep. Yeah. It's Tuesday, which means it's the first day of the Shift Summer League, at least right. the Open Qualifiers. We have some good Summer teams League. in that, too. Good teams. Well, we got, uh, we got, I mean, a lot to talk about. Like they said, Shift Summer League coming up. We got Quals beginning Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, Europe will be happening at 7 Central European time. Uh, NA will be happening at 7 p.m. Eastern time, so y'all be sure to uh, stay tuned on that. There's no main broadcast for Open Qual and no main broadcast tomorrow for play-in, uh, but next week is when things will, will get kicking. So um, let's just jump right into it. Beast Mound, how was this season for you? Give us, a, uh, give us some insight, a little bit of a recap for R8 and their RLCS season. Also, for people who might not know who you are, I, I can't – Imagine anyone oh, not knowing who you, you are. Can. Of course you can. That's not, no, no, no. I mean, I appreciate all the compliments. No, uh, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Beast Band. I am a, a Dutch coach. I'm relatively new, but I've had uh, a fair amount of success, if I dare say so myself, in the Middle Eastern region. Uh, my first team uh, was with Basel and the Twins. I was in Calais. That was back at the original Game is 8. So that is now two years ago. And ever since then, I've had various teams uh, in and out of the Middle East. Um, it's one of the regions that I absolutely love coaching, but I've also definitely had my fair share of uh, struggles with. Um, so I guess that's the short summary of me. But um, I mean, this season, R8, uh, I only like got into the team halfway through the season. Um, uh, I, uh, I was approached by Basel again. Uh, I coached him like two years ago and he was like, listen, Beast, we, we need some help. We're struggling with, you know, the, the big teams that have formed at the, the top of me. Now we want to compete. And I was interested, obviously. Uh, I've always liked competing for a top spot. And my team in Europe was uh, not looking too, too hot. Uh, they were all looking to go their separate ways. So uh, I was eager to, to to try my luck again in, in the Middle East. And I really only like did the second major with them and then two of the Saudi League. Uh, if you follow me now, you'll know that that is a very, very frequent event. Very, very fun to watch. Completely like the top of the Middle East again, competing against each other, like a, a separate league. It's really, really fun to watch. And it's quite a big deal within the region, right? With yes. the lands oh, yeah, and no, everything. No. Yeah, I mean, uh, the top six, it used to be top six, uh, or it used to be top eight, top six nowadays, just are there on location in Riyadh. I was lucky enough to attend twice this year. So, yeah, I've had a, I've had a, I've had a great time this year. Um, kind of like flew in like March and immediately, like, the, like three weeks after, I was already in Riyadh for the first event. Um, and then Major 2, and then now the, the second event. Uh, and sadly, my, my contract has ended with them. Uh, I am relatively expensive for a guy that doesn't really speak Arabic. I'll be honest. I've been working on it, but it's it's the main concern for me still. <laughs> it's it's not the easiest language. I'll be honest, but mm -hmm. no, I mean the team. I love the team. I love the the, the region. It's been very welcoming to to kind of be there and be able to compete. Uh, okay, I've got a couple of questions then, based on those things that you just mentioned there. Um, first up. Talk to us a little bit about that language barrier. And then so you have the second one in your mind. I want to ask you, uh, what is that land like in Riyadh that's happened a little bit more frequently with Saudi E-League relative uh, or compared to RLCS? But we can, we can start with the language barrier stuff. How does that work? How do you navigate that? The language barrier, it, it mainly limits me. Um, the, the communication for the team all happens in Arabic. Um, I have a setup that allows me to kind of let... At least if someone is talking by themselves, uh, let it be translated uh, using just Google Translate, which doesn't always work in 100% well, uh, but at least I can follow their conversations. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to me speaking English to them and them speaking Arabic between themselves. Uh, most of the people I coach, they have at least a fair understanding. Uh, they're all very 
most of the people I've coached are very timid. They, they, they don't really want to try with English. They all feel like they don't really like know the language as well. But I found that most people do know a surprising amount of, of yeah. English uh, um, because there is a lot of content also in Saudi Arabia. Like even most stores, most um, shows, they all feature English as well. So they all know a fair amount of English, but they, they're very uncomfortable talking. Um, yeah. And that, that definitely is the main concern. And that limits me as a, as a coach, as a Arabic speaking coach in the region. 100%. Is that so I'm, I'm guessing when you're not like in a time crunch, like a, a scrim or something, it's probably not terrible. But I imagine like when you get into live events or like a timeout or something, that's probably really, it's probably really challenging. Yeah, it's it's really it's mainly also distracting. Uh, so you have to like you already have to kind of limit how much you do. Obviously, if they're focused on Rocket League and I go and speak a language they don't feel very comfortable in, it's it takes them out of their focus. So you have to limit yourself to the absolute necessities. Uh, you can't go and give them like a, a speech. You can't be the motivator you want to be. Uh, it also just limits you in, in how much you actually can get to know about them. Uh, I like to get like personal with the players. I like to know how they progress themselves. I like to know how they do certain things. And that's just something they, they aren't always able to, to, to navigate around. So it does limit me in a way, but uh, yeah, again, I'm, I'm hundred percent like thankful for the opportunities I've been given and nothing but love for the, for yeah, the, the region. So yeah. yeah, of course. And now um, that follow up about the lands, do you notice any difference between like an RLCS land versus the Saudi E-League land? I've, so I've sadly never got to work a major myself. Oh, okay. um, the only events I've, I've worked are <laughs> Gamers 8 and uh, Saudi League. So gotcha, only okay. LAN events I've worked are, well, Gamers 8 was in Riyadh as well. So are all in Riyadh. Um, I mean, there is definitely a, a big difference. The, the crowds there are less uh, in person. So there's not as much of a... A uh, hyping crowd that's yelling. There's there's usually a couple of people there, but it will it will be limited to a certain amount until it's the the, the major kind of events. Um, quality wise, for me, it, I'm more worried about work. Um, what I've seen, I've attended RLCS events, but I've never got to work one. From what I've seen, uh, there is a lot more kind of privacy, whereas in in Saudi, for example, uh, they have this this very cool venue. I, I really enjoy it. Um, you, you drive there, you get to the, the place. There's just a, a big stage. Everything's well set up. There's a small uh, stands where people can watch. There's just a caster's booth. And then there's just six rooms. That's just the stairs away, realistically. So it's not like you have your own private rooms behind the scenes. You can walk off and have like a, a private moment. You just sit next to each other. There's a cubicle here, there's a cubicle here, a cubicle there. And that's, that's kind of it. Yeah. Um, but it's very hard to compare because I've never yet, sure. hopefully, got to work yeah. a major. But uh, yeah. I, I, I have yeah. dreams. I'm, I'm in there for the long run. Uh, I mean, we I talked little, about it a little bit on the last episode of Shift Gas, where in Rocket League, we haven't really had, like you see in some bigger esports like League of Legends or CSGO, where players are like real divas and cannot get in the crowd or they'll just get swarmed. I mean, it happened a little bit in London. Uh, but it does happen, and that's already it shows that in Rocket League, it's the, the players are very close to the audience, and not just literally, but also they, they're just they're just interacting a lot, and you don't really see that. So maybe it's not that different from RSS than you think having those rooms set up. Like definitely, there 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 is like obviously still like differences but i don't think i think that has more to do with just the age of rocket league i mean rocket league turned nine yesterday that's young that's young it's a completely new genre uh like csgo is was it 1540 years old now i believe uh it was it was around when i started shift in 87 yeah that was yeah <laughs> i remember very well that was <laughs> my primary inspiration really uh this big big i respect it yeah no i mean yeah, Rocket League, uh, if you look at, uh, I saw a video the other day of uh, Faker, the, I mean, everyone knows Faker, who am I kidding? Uh, he was just walking on, a, on an airport, and there was just like 20 security guards around him, because otherwise he doesn't get places. He needs That's that full I mean, army. Yeah. Like, people crowd him, and uh, like a meet and greet in Rocket League means that the team just walks there. Maybe, like, maybe they'll have the manager be like, oh, sorry, can we pass real quick? But everyone's like, yeah, of course you can. Uh, there'll Completely be like a different. few, but like that's no. Nah, we got places to go. Rocket League still got places to go. I mean, I mean, it's still already it's already changed. I mean, in season two in Amsterdam with like two two thousand people in the audience, 
the uh, players were just using the same bathrooms as everyone else as well. So I just needed to go and I stepped into this bathroom and that was just Jacob from NRG. You didn't tell Jacob to lock just the door there. after himself, right? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it, was nah, just, it wasn't in any stalls or anything. I just walked oh, into the... It's just, it's just one, one port to port. It was just there. No, no, yeah, that means you know. we, we, we've been going places. I mean, yeah, I, I mean slow, uh, slowly. I'm one of the most Maybe popular steps. people about Rocket League, and I'll be very honest about it. I don't think, it, it, yeah, it's, it's going nowhere. We, we've got places to go, 100%. Um, I actually wanted to ask, kind of go away from Mina real quick, because I want to talk a little bit about another uh, coaching job that you had, uh, which was coaching Endpoint UV. Um, yeah. You know, women's Rocket League is something that has gained quite a bit of steam, I would say, over the last two years. You know, them getting LAN, um, and I know there's been some issues in terms of, like, getting everything organized with some of the orgs that were running it, but um, <laughs> I guess my question was, is... Um, you know, what was, was there a difference in coaching a women's team versus coaching an RLCS team? And if so, like, how did you have to change it? Because I know in traditional sports, sometimes coaches say they have to change their thing, but in gaming, it, there's not that much of a difference. So I, I was, I was hoping you could provide some insight on how that was and, and what you felt in that time. For me, this is a little bit different. I feel like if you ask most coaches, I think they will have changed things. I, I as a coach, I've coached 12 years. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I've coached longer than Rocket League existed. I used to coach track and field. So I knew what coaching was before Rocket League was a thing. I take people, I learn from the people, I help them progress. Um, and I think one of the, the bigger things that, that like I personally can give Rocket League, or like I know good coaches can give Rocket League is, Coaching still has a long way to go in Rocket League. Good coaches make an impact. There is good coaches about, don't get me wrong. There's also a lot of just friends or people just, you know, I call them cheerleaders. And there's nothing wrong with that. They absolutely will still have a, a positive effect, but um, that's different. So the difference for me between like an RLCS level team, teams competing for like major spots um, and, 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 and female Rocket League doesn't necessarily vary so much in uh the way i approach the team more so in what you get back so even if uh, if i were to coach someone who's just a diamond as long as they are ambitious enough and willing to work i coach them the same amount as i would someone that's an rlcs because you put the same amount of hours and you make the same kind of progress as long as you're willing to put those hours in um so i don't think that's too much uh, the main issue with them i'll be very honest i really enjoyed my time with endpoint and with the team uh i'm still on very good terms with with, with the people and uh, i'm very happy to see them still competing the main issue they had, there was just no tournaments. So there was no no ways to measure themselves. Radiant was the one thing. There was like talks of a tournament being created, but at some point there was like three months and there was just no motivation. Uh, and that was that was for them just the main, like coaching a team with no ambition or no, no measuring point kind of up ahead, that's very different. And that's the main, main difference between the, those two. Um, when you were kind of in that lull period, where you didn't know if there's going to be anything to compete in. Did you attempt anything to try to keep motivation going or, or what? I mean, I'm sure you would like, you know, were like, you know, let's keep on track, let's keep practicing. We never know what's going to happen. But were there anything like special ideas that you might have had that you were sitting in bed one day and thought, okay, I'm going to do this. And then at, like, maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. Do you have any sort of special ideas during that time that maybe made you a better coach? Uh, yeah, I mean, 100% have IDs, um, and, and they work for myself, but it's very hard to give someone motivation. Uh, if, hmm. you know, if, if people don't believe in your scene long enough, if you get doubted every game you get into, and especially like uh, one of the players at the time was having a hard time where people were just giving her a lot of like trash whenever she'd queue up. So she was just having a, a very bad time in Rocket League altogether. It's very hard to motivate someone who's no measuring, measuring points and no positive like experiences in the game whatsoever so like oh yeah my coach is telling me to just focus on myself and do this but like ultimately i don't feel like playing the game uh it, yeah it's very hard to just like create that and yeah um i think i'm i'm pretty capable at like giving people individual goals uh listen hey i know you like this let's see if we can get you to, to focus on this for a bit right let's take a step back from the the freeze and the team stuff i know you really like your mechanics so let's see if we can find a way for you to to master this mechanic or you know uh, make it a consistent quadruple flip musty pancake off the backboard ceiling stall shuffle pancake again project musty. daniel 
Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you got it, you can you can keep coming up with goals as long as, long as you're creative enough. It will be fun, but ultimately, it's their motivation and their ambition that carries them through. Typical Dutch trying to promote a pancake agenda. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Slow up, <laughs> Um, so and then bad. quickly, <laughs> um, I guess I want to go back to something you said, which is that you felt like you've been coaching basically the entire time that Rocket League existed before Rocket League existed. You feel like it has a lot way to go. I thought one of the coolest points of the London major was during the G2 Furia final, uh, semifinal. And I know they'd done this in previous lands, maybe the last one, but they brought in Sad Jr. to almost like tell the crowd, like, hey, what would you give your, um, what would you give your players in this, at the this spot being down 2-0 to G2? And he, he was really technical with it. He was like, we need to follow our touches up better. We need to make sure that we're not letting them get space. And to me, that represented a little bit of a change in terms of coaching, where it actually gave uh, people watching an insight to what a coach would actually say instead of just being like, "That coach is good because his team's winning. This team is good, bad. This team, this coach is bad because his team's losing." Um, so, for you, how have you seen the coaching around you when you're speaking to other coaches kind of change? And do you think we're getting close to a point where coaching is a lot more tactical and less mental, or do you think the mental side is still kind of dominating? coaching in Rocket League? It, it will be a combination. It's, it's, it very, first of all, it depends on what players you coach. If you have a player that's very able to do the analysis themselves, that knows how to set their own goals and really is just struggling to, to get in that routine or to get on the game, and then you need a coach that's there for the mental, someone that makes it fun for them to be there, and that, that will be enough. If you have a coach that's really analytical and can give you exactly where you need to go and what to focus on but you have a player that's that's already got the, the peak men so you've got a match made in heaven as well right i think overall i just like it i'm not specifically targeting coaches i'm not specifically talking about what i'm seeing i'm i'm more thinking that the analysis which is often presented as coaching is not necessarily the full coaching product and uh, right if you ask the average diamond player right now like oh hey what do you think a coach does he's like oh yeah he points me at my mistakes and I'm like, that's less than a tenth of what you do as a coach, right? Like, you you know, sure, pointing at mistakes is cool, but everyone can see, oh, you missed your flip, you made a mistake. Ha ha, that's not, that's not coaching. That's, you know, where do you give them the motivation? How can you give them the tools to actually make the improvements thereafter? Can you see the process? Can you see their individual points? There's so much more going on that for me as a coach, like I run into all the time, honestly, I mean, uh, I don't mean to, to promote, but like whenever I, I stream, for example, I get a lot of people that just come into my chat and they're like, oh, you're a, you're a GC player. How do you coach professional players? You're not as good as them. And I'm like, so listen, I'm, I'm more than happy to and like explain every single time what a coach does, but it's not like I go to a professional player, right? It's not like I, I coach them. It's like, listen, I do this and it's working for me. You should try it. Because that <laughs> doesn't work. It's not, it's not that like, so... I think just the general idea of what a coach does is something that's just undervalued for a lot of like areas. And that's yeah, an interesting one for me. Where do you stream again, Beastbound? <sighs> oh, I don't know. Where, where is that? What, what's, <laughs> what's the link that we can... Where can we find you? Yeah, I, I, I stream where, on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash Beastbound. Oh, thanks. Oh, so there now. we go. There we go. There, yeah. There's someone, <laughs> something yeah. I want to ask you. No as well, Because I hate yeah. when casters use the phrase, when there's a timeout called, in the middle of a series, this is where the coach, you know, earns their salary, makes their money worth. I, personally, that's my pet peeve. I'm thinking if this is where the coach needs to make their money, then what have they been doing 99% yeah. of the time? <laughs> You're too late. Uh, it, uh, yeah, again, it's not all of what it. What do you it, think it, of that? So for me, to defend the cast is that's one of the ways to say, listen up here, everyone watching, Go look at it. Like often, you you then get the shot of you know Seth you going. <laughs> and, and that's, that's, that's what you want to see, hey, right? Bro, hey, like, you got oh, a yeah, like, in, like, yeah, no, but like <laughs> he knows what's going on. Yeah, of course, of course, I know what's behind the scenes as well. I've, I've done I've done a fair share of everything. For the for the car says you need to make a show and to say listen look at the card like this is where the coach comes in and he needs to step up. The team's not been pulling their weight. The team's slacking. They need to make that like, they need to make that change now. Yes, coaches absolutely can make a difference. If you are able to pull off a Braveheart level speech, right, in that one minute and you get them all riled up and they're just like, you know what? Yeah, actually, we can win this game. Like, if you can change the mental, you've earned your money. 
But if you've not done anything up until that point, that speech is not going to help much as well. So I get where you're coming from. I get where the casters are coming from. Uh, but if yeah. you are only cast, or if you're only coasting for the like three minutes you have in timeouts every every old major, then you might want to find a different <laughs> profession, in my opinion. But then again, hey, I don't judge. <laughs> so right. let's go back to let's go back to Mina. Um, <laughs> this year, as we as we know, uh, Mina is uh, you know some people, not me, but some people would call a one team region. Uh, Team Falcons won all six um, regionals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or open qualifiers, I guess. And it's a kind of a level of dominance that we've only seen a few times. We saw it a bunch this year, actually, in North America. G2 obviously won the lion's share. Uh, Oceana, and then back in RLCSX, you had uh, then, then Sound, Sand Rock Gaming, or sorry, RLCS 2122. We had Sand Rock Gaming that turned to yeah. Falcons, and then BDS in RLCSX. And I've always had the idea that a team being super, super dominant is actually quite good for a region because it, it kind of raises the level of play for everyone else. Uh, we saw in Europe what happened after the BDS era was the best year I've probably have ever seen in a year and a half after um, that happened. And then uh, I think North America is starting to get quite good again now that they have uh, a benchmark to hit with G2. Uh, so, you know, for players, you know, you're coaching all right, and th there's almost like this idea of there's this boogeyman that you have to go through to win. One, how do you feel like it influences the quality of the region? And two, how do you coach and get your players to sort of believe that they can beat this team that is like seems like they're untouchable at this point and, and give them the sort of mental stability to go in and compete every day like they can win, even if everybody on the internet, everybody is telling them that they have no chance? Uh, first off, everybody on the internet does not matter. That's that's less than one. It's hard to tell kids um, that though. I, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. But like, uh, I don't know. I don't remember exactly who told it to me. But like, uh, the advice I got the other day was like, don't listen to advice from people you wouldn't ask for feedback, right? If you don't like, if you don't and like aren't already like in a position where you'd like take advice from someone, if they are critiquing you, that has nothing to do with what I'm doing. So that's that's a very simple one for me to just say. All right, cool. That's not worry about every. Uh, in the Netherlands, we say uh, like house, stand, and coke. So it's ha house, garden, and kitchen. Uh, like just everyone that's just in their own home, garden, or kitchen, just critiquing, analyzing from home. Unless they bring up something new, that does not matter. The the people that we compete against, we practice against as well. Um, so Falcons, you play them in scrims. You see them in scrims. You analyze the games. You see what is going wrong, um, and. Or, you know they're improving as well uh, again falcons have a very very good coaching staff on hand um like you know that there is just a, a bunch of things that they can do to improve as well but you have th that thing you're working towards we want to reach this we want to see progression and for me win or lose i don't necessarily care too much uh, it's gonna sound silly but i care more about the progression i can make with the team so the lessons i can learn than you know this one series and obviously you know if you you, you keep falling short in those semi-finals uh i mean i i'm a four-time regional finalist i have yet to win one of course it hurts every time you lose but ultimately i think i'll learn from those experiences enough that at some point i make it and that's that's worth it for me so as long as you can get your team ambitious enough motivated enough to keep working that's more important to me from your perspective with a team like that do you think the players treat it the way Michael's describing, like this is a, a bar that we are chasing after and we're trying to, you know, achieve this or ascend past this? Or do you think it can yeah, even be... Yeah, bars Yeah. So it's right, not, yeah, not, yeah. not something that they get discouraged by. For, for everyone, if you are competing and you are trying to become the person that's there, you're doing the wrong thing. You're trying to be better than them. Yeah. And you should do. And I, I do think that like having a stable bar, right? Like if you have a different team that's on top every week, it's very hard to kind of get that trajectory locked in whereas if you have that one team there's definitely benefits to it but i think in general as a as a region there's a lot of progression to make if you have a team that's clearly on top like like falcons is now you can say listen what they do is working we need to work on what they are doing because they keep beating us how do we work on that and if everyone works on that the entire region is collectively fixing that mistake or collectively fixing what they are kind of getting beat on and that as long as there is enough guidance good coaching good people working behind the scenes or enough ambition with the players themselves you will find the region improves overall yes 100%.
Yeah, I think especially with a, an expansion region like Mina uh, going and watching Falcons like look genuinely like the best team in the world for a large majority of the last tournament, it's got to be quite motivating, right? Because it's like if you're a team who's taken them to five or even beaten them or gotten really close, it's like we're that close to beating a team that could that might be the best team in the world. If we can get there, if we can get to like our consistency like them, that means we're like right there at the best teams in the world. Yeah, um, yeah and makes yeah. Sense. Uh, Sorry, uh, yeah, like what even like works is if you look at Falcons play against teams on major, right? And Falcon stakes uh, goes to like Falcon in in round three in the group stage, they they swept G two, right? They went three and zero, oh. and then you think back, listen, we played them twice in the events. We took a game off them every single time. Did we do better than G two? Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, we're not a better team overall. You can't say that. That's not something you can do. It's a completely different stage, but it is a how close are we really? And it is a wake up call. Like, oh wait, we're we're not that far off. And I do think, in general, there's a there's a case to be made for the entire world to kind of uh, have gotten a lot closer skill wise. I think this was one of the most enjoyable majors I've seen in a very long time because I felt there was such a like large group of teams where if you you know like you, it used to be like oh if someone made a case for some team to win you'd be like that's outrageous. What are you talking about? Are you you know? How long have you held your breath? But uh, right now, there's just so many teams where you could like, oh yeah, Fury could win the thing. Yeah, of course they can. G2 can win the thing. Yeah, Space Station on the day, they can win the thing. G2, Gen G, bunch of European teams, Falcons, of course they can win. The, like, no one's going to dispute it. Of course, there will always be someone to dispute it. But like, on their day, they can win the event. And it's as simple as that. And the consistency with the top tier level teams, that is still beyond impressive. But to see a team like you know the team you've been competing against or region go up against it consistently make those numbers that does bits and that does bits for your confidence as well 100 percent. yeah and and the depth i think is something that's become kind of uh it's been a big comp top uh piece of conversation throughout the year uh because the two majors have looked so competitive especially in that top eight nine teams but in terms of the depth of mina it's it's all it's often compared to like the depth of sam because they're kind of like partner regions where they have this one team at the top that everyone's and then they have other teams at the bottom but it seems like sam is viewed as a much deeper region um just because the mina teams that have gone the mina two seeds that have gone to the majors this year haven't fared out that well what do you think from from someone who coached and and, and like you said you're in scrims you're doing replays how do you feel that the mina mina as a region has to what they have to do or, or what the trajectory they have to be to be on is to get to that level of sam where you have people saying man they got six teams that could go to round five swiss at a major make top eight at a major it seems like right now everyone kind of agrees that mina and sam at the top are very similar but sam kind of has uh progressed a little quicker on the from that like two to three to like seven three to eight level i mean so what what i've seen a lot and this is this is um it has a lot to do with what is kind of happening with the the practice behind the scenes. So to give you a little bit of insight, the reason why I think Mina and, and South America are as close to what the top regions are is because they have a lot more opportunity. A region like APAC, they can't scrim against Europe. They can't scrim against NA. Sub-Saharan Africa, they can't scrim. So despite uh, Australia, OC, having been part of ROCS for as long as they have, the kind of... Um, exchange of information or exchange of practice has been limited to those worldwide international events. And it's part of the reason why, it, like in my opinion, O still has a lot to catch up on every single time. They keep catching up with what the level was, but then obviously the other regions have gone up as well. I think the exchange of information between the Middle East and Europe has been successful at the top, but anything below the top is very limited still, where a top four team in MENA and a top four team in Europe do not scrim. Top four in Europe will scrim with like a top eight to top one, obviously, like a top eight range in Europe, but then they won't scrim against number four in MENA, which uh, has to do with various reasons from uh, a big culture difference where MENA has, um, especially in like a previous year, there's been lots of issues with people and uh, well, religion's a big theme there, so they have their prayer times. This just means they can be 50 minutes late. That's not acceptable in Europe. If you are 50 minutes late, they just like say, no worries, and you're on a, a, a no scrim list. So you kind of get like written off as a team we're not scrimming anymore, whereas only the top two really consistently get asked for those scrims, or a top three, um, or you must have the connections uh, that with the language barrier. And I do think with Sam, it's been a lot more 
exchange, especially now that we've seen Complexity and Furia make the swap between regions. That's a bunch of information, a bunch of practice, a bunch of experience that all of a sudden comes into a region and everyone can kind of feast on, right? Oh, whoa, they've brought all these new things. Let's let's enjoy that. You can analyze all you want. I can look at a G2 replay, show it to my players and be like, listen, we got to play like this, or we got to do this, or we got to fix this so we can do this. But that doesn't give you that practice. That doesn't give you that experience. And I do feel like South America has the edge on that a little bit over the Middle East. Yeah. You talked a lot about scrims, but do you think that, or do you see that a team like Team Falcons is proving the same kind of opponent as they are in the actual RLCS competition? Is it is it one on one? Is it completely different? Do they just try different stuff there? How does that work? Um, I think it's hard to make a comparison between scrims and, and match day. Moves are different. Tactics are different. Are you trying something? Are you working on something? What kind of scrim is it? For me, I have three types of scrims. I have a scrim where I warm up. I have a scrim where I practice something specific. And I have a scrim where I want them to try. And the difference between those three is vast, where I feel like if you are a decent 1800, if we are warming up, you can score a couple of goals on us. But if we are practicing match day and the energy is locked in, you're not touching the ball. I'm sorry. So there's, it's such a big difference in skill level and how you kind of approach these scrims that it, it it's not a yes or no answer in there that I can give on that question. Well, isn't that really annoying, though, if you're trying to try in a scrim and the other team is just trying new stuff? No. Does that not matter? The scrimming is always going to be annoying, but for me, the idea of having stuff be depending on one scrim is... Not the way forwards. Mm -hmm. Games in Rocket League are too short. I don't think a single team really sits down and says, we're going to scrim this one thing for the full hour. People don't have that kind of attention span. I think you should have a transition. You can take several games and be like, listen, these five games we did really well, but these last two games, I could tell the, the energy was off. Uh, I can tell this was not working. Or, you know, you're doing two hours, three hours consecutively. The first scrim, I want you to warm up because we need to do well. You can't fault a team for doing the same thing because they're an hour later, because you want to try. You have to learn how to use that practice. If you compare it to, again with other esports, for example, lots of other um, esports, they practice against themselves, right? If you are practicing in League of Legends, you're playing against the B team from the same organization or the sub roster or the, the coaches, or and you, you've got five hours, good luck, right? That's that's your your scrim. So it, the, the difference is so vast in how you practice that you kind of have to be flexible with the way you approach practice. And yes, you can get upset because you know at some point you can tell the attentions off with the opponents. But if you don't learn from those, then hey, good luck competing. That's tough. <laughs> uh, you've you've got the experience from Mina. What you hear from Europe, at least on Twitter, is that some teams like to troll scrims. Yeah. Does that Happen is that have you experienced that? Of course, yeah. There is there's people that just don't respect other people. If you think uh, an opponent's bad, you don't want to scrim and you manage to set it up. They didn't really ask you. The it happens. Uh, that happens in Mina. That happens. I think in every region. It's also just bad days, right? Uh, we all have bad days. If you're having a bad day during scrims, but I do think people are too soon to make like assumptions based on a singular game or a singular, right? If you've won five games and you then miss a simple ball, are you now trolling the scrim? According to most Rocket League professionals, the answer is yes. How, how quickly is that like opinion set, I guess, man? Yeah. Well, yeah, well. <laughs> Beast. Um, man, thank you so much for carving out some time. You mentioned Absolutely. earlier the Twitch stream. Obviously, we've talked at length about your coaching stuff, but that's not all you do. So talk a little bit about the content, maybe what's on your channel, when you stream. If there's anyone here that is wanting to learn, I think this is a fantastic place to do so. So give us some information about uh, the other things that you do. Yeah, I mean, again, appreciate the, the chance to be here as well. Um, I, I stream frequently. I'm, I'm full-time as a coach, so I make my money coaching on the site. I love to stream. Uh, most afternoons, early mornings for NA folks. I will be live uh, on my channel, like I said. I do a lot of just playing. Uh, I like to just have a good time. I love music. I will sing a lot. Uh, I really enjoy singing. Um, I just mainly make sure that it's good. So honestly, yeah. 
swing by. But if you have questions, I'm, I'm always down to have a, a real conversation. I'm very open about what I do. Very passionate. I'm very honest. I want to become the best. I will work for it. So that's what I, uh, I promise. Go. That's what I got. Yeah. Some lovely guitars behind you as well. Uh, and I, I can tell you, as someone that's heard him sing, he is good. Well, look, we're, oh, yeah. we're going to drop the uh, we'll drop the link here in the chat, and we'll drop it in the description below for the YouTube uh, video. Beastbound, thank you so much, man. We appreciate it, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Much love, fellas. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Thank you for watching this segment of the Shiftcast. Again, you can catch the full episode here on our YouTube channel or on Spotify. Thank you for watching.